So this morning we're going to be discussing how it is really all about humility. So who likes the word humility? Anybody? Nope. Nope? How about who wants to be humbled? Probably not. No. Uh, who wants to suffer? Oh. Any takers? Oh. So here's a question. What was one of the number one attitudes that, so attitudes that Jesus tried to instill uh, to the disciples during his three, three and a half years? An attitude. What was the attitude Jesus was instilling in his disciples? Starts with an H. Honor. Humility. Humility. Yes, to be a servant. So Jesus wanted the attitude of being a servant, a humility and a willingness to put others in front of themselves. And so this morning we're going to be in 2 Corinthians, but before we get into our message, I have a uh, about five minute video on Corinth that is very interesting and fascinating. So let's take a look at this. Business and order in Roman Corinth. When Paul came to Corinth, he found a city that was enjoying remarkable economic growth. It was a city of opportunity for the merchant, craftsperson, and something rare indeed in the ancient world, the social climber. Corinth is located on a narrow isthmus between the Aegean and Adriatic seas. It is well placed to profit from trade between the eastern and western Mediterranean. Ships unloaded on the east side of the isthmus where their goods were transported over land and then reloaded on the west side. The Emperor Nero attempted to cut a canal across the isthmus in AD 67 to facilitate sea trade, but the project proved too difficult and was abandoned until modern engineering made it possible in the 19th century. Corinth's city center was surrounded by rows of shops, porches, and roofed entrances. These alcoves are all that remain of the series of shops in the downtown area's northwest sector. The Temple of Apollo, visible in the background, reminds visitors that the worship of the traditional Greco-Roman gods surrounded and supported the everyday life of the city. A long row of connected shops also ran along the south side of the city center. The grassy area would have once been the walkway of the long, covered portico, or columned porches, which ran in front of the entire length of shops. Shops also sat on the west end of the city, just below the temple of Hera, the wife of Zeus. Another market area arose to the north of the city, again with rows of shops and open spaces for the sale of wares and foods. Paul likely worked as a tent maker in one of these spaces, or another such space yet to be discovered, finding a place at the better established workshop of Priscilla and Achilla, his fellow Christians and evangelists. When the Emperor Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome in 49 CE, Priscilla and Achilla relocated to the promising city of Corinth and set up shop shortly before Paul's arrival there, described in Acts 18 verses 1 to 3. Corinth had its central meat market, called a Macellum, in the northeast quarter of the downtown area. Originally a shrine to Apollo, this structure was converted to a more practical function by the time Paul visited Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 25, when he told his converts to eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, he was likely referring to this well-known space. As Corinth grew, private citizens took on more public works and gained public recognition. When one citizen named Erastus was elected to the office of Edile, the office entrusted with overseeing public buildings and festivals, he showed his appreciation by paving an area north of the theater complex. An inscription still visible today provides perpetual recognition for his gift. This may it's the internet connection have been well. the same Erastus mentioned in Romans chapter 16, verse 23, who served as the city's treasurer and who had become part of the Christian congregation in Corinth. The Babius monument shows the self-promoting and self-congratulatory spirit of Roman Corinth. Gnaeus Babius Philanus was a freed man, a former slave, who rose to the offices of Edile, local priest, and, and Duovir, one of the city's two chief magistrates. 
He authorized the construction of this monument to himself as a testimony to his name, success, and benefactions to the city. The monument originally consisted of eight columns arranged in a circle, each bearing an ornate Corinthian capital adornment like this one, altogether supporting a cone-shaped roof. The same spirit of boasting, claiming honor, and calling for recognition would invade the Christian congregation in Corinth. Paul's ministry in Corinth aroused significant opposition from the Jewish community there, which no doubt saw Paul as a competitor for the support of Gentiles sympathetic to the Jewish religion. Acts chapter 18 in verses 7 to 8 records that Paul even drew away the leader of the synagogue and started meeting at the house of Titius Justus, a rich Gentile God-fearer evidence of a Jewish community in Corinth includes this partial inscription, which translates to gathering place of the Hebrews. This capital, decorated with menorahs and palm branches, once adorned the top of a pillar, probably from the synagogue in Corinth. Opposition to Paul and his new church building efforts came to a head with the arrival of a new proconsul, Lucius Junius Gallio, governor of Achaia in 51 to 53 AD. The buildings in the foreground are the remains of the North Basilica, the headquarters of the proconsular governor of Achaia, and the place where he would have conducted most of his business. According to Acts chapter 18 verse 12, however, members of the Jewish community brought their accusations against Paul to Gallio at the tribunal, or Bema. Members of Corinth's Jewish community charged Paul with introducing unlawful religious customs, something that would typically fall under the jurisdiction of the secular authority. Upon further examination, Gallio ruled that this was all just an internal Jewish affair in which he would not intervene. Only the foundation of the structure remains. The governor would have heard cases seated in an ornate structure atop this platform. This is another view of the bima from the southwest, showing the ascent to the top of the platform. The suit against Paul was unsuccessful, and he was able to spend a considerable time further in that city, nurturing the congregation that would prove to be his most difficult over time. here. I hope you enjoyed that short little video there. There's a couple uh, specific highlights I want to draw out. One was mentioning boasting, which happened to be because Corinth was one of the few cities back in the ancient world during this time period where you could rise in social status. They mentioned the slave who was freed who became a powerful leader. So you were able, to, almost like America, they were able to make something of themselves through hard work and, in their opinions, the blessings of the gods or so forth. Uh, most cities, you were born into a social status and you stayed there for your entire life. So this kind of gives a little idea about what's going on with Corinth and we'll see a little bit more as we go along in our message. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 1 through 10 is what we're going to be covering. So if you have your Bibles, maybe start making your way over there. In general, 2 Corinthians is a monumental treatise by Paul. It's, he talks about his views of ministry, and he also has to defend himself from false teachers who are invading Corinth and trying to take away the Christians from the truth. The passage we're looking at this morning talks about extreme suffering and trials. And if this passage is good enough for the most severe of issues, it's more than sufficient for all of our trials that we go through in our lives. This is definitely a jewel, this passage in Scripture. And it's helped me after uh, the last hospitalization with septic shock. And thank you all for praying. So after we got out of the hospital, I uh, came across this passage and really started studying it. And said, hey, this is a wonderful passage. And decided to teach on it there for you guys. Um, and so Paul, here he is. He's trying to process why the Lord is letting all these things happen in his life. Why is there so much trouble in the life of this faithful man? 
he's where a lot of Christians are and even pastors because they're pouring, we're pouring our lives out for the Lord, but then we're also taking a lot of internal and external abuse. There's struggles, there's disappointment, there's discouragement. Some are being down, some are beleaguered, some are wondering, why is all this happening? And so in this powerful scripture that is emotionally charged, Paul's heart is broken. He's shattered by his enemies. His loyalty is being attacked. His ability to lead is being called into question. His decisions are questioned. His love's doubted and even denied. And on top of the physical pain, there's that worse pain. And that's the pain to have his people, the Corinthian Christians, turning their backs on him. That's one of the most severe pains in life, isn't it? From people, when they turn their back on you or they attack you. Um, and even people that are close to us or are more invested in our lives, it's even more profound wounds when they turn on us and so forth. So Paul's like, here I am. I'm being faithful, Lord. What is going on here? How do I deal with this betrayal and hurt? So... In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 through 13, so on the surface, today's passage looks like this is the lowest point in Paul's life. We'll get to reading the passage in just a couple minutes. But in reality, this is a pathway to true encouragement in life. So here Paul is. His legitimate authority is under attack. Now we know Paul was not the most gifted orator. He was not the most charismatic preacher out there. And Back then, as it is today, a lot of times people are you know, drawn to charismatic, magnetic, poised, larger than life people. It goes for ministry and it also goes in the business world too. Um, Steve Jobs, if you ever watched one of his presentations for how he rolled out the products for Apple, this man was a charismatic, magnetic speaker. Amazing presentation skills. Not only that, he's obviously a genius for all the Apple products he created. But so people were drawn and allured to him. And then that also goes for some in ministry. Unfortunately, in ministry, sometimes the larger-than-life pastors end up becoming a little too big for their britches and fall. But, so here Paul is. These false teachers are claiming that Paul is in ministry for sexual favors, for money, He's a liar, he's a fraud with no authority from the true apostles, he, that he's fabricated his success, success stories. Well, I would venture to say that's what all the false teachers are doing. They're claiming Paul's doing what they're doing. Remember, Paul spent about a year and a half in Corinth, being a tent maker, as came out and was mentioned in the video. Now, Paul's gone, so these false teachers have come in and are taking advantage of Paul's absence big time. And I'd say that these false teachers probably were charismatic, probably did have the best ways to speak in the Greek world because Greeks loved oratory. They loved solid presentation. So I would say that they had that. They may even were able to do some spectacular displays of spiritual power that I would say were demon-possessed. But whatever they were doing, they were drawing people away from the church to their teaching. So Paul was afraid of what this bad company was going to do to them. And here's a little illustration that's kind of comical, but it, it hits home about bad company. There was a farmer. He was troubled by a flock of crows in his cornfield. He loaded his shotgun and crawled unseen along the fence row, determined to get a shot at the crows. Now the farmer back home had a very sociable parrot who made friends with everybody. Seeing the flock of crows, the parrot decided to fly over and hang out with them. You know, he was just being sociable. Well, the farmer crawled up there. He saw the crows, but he didn't see the parrot. He took careful aim and bang, took his shot. Well, he crawled over the fence. He wanted to go pick up the fallen crows. And what did he see? His parrot. Badly ruffled with a broken wing, but the parrot was still alive. <coughs> Tenderly, the farmer picked up his parrot and carried him home. And his children were there and said, Papa, what happened? And they were starting to cry. Before 
he could answer that parrot yelled, bad company. <laughs> so you can see how Paul, in a sense, had a legitimate reason to be afraid of what these false apostles were going to do to the Corinthian church. Now I know I don't need to mention it, but I'm going to mention it anyways. Job 5.7 says, Yet man is born unto trouble, and as the sparks fly upward. So trouble defines life in this fallen world. Everything, everyone's fallen. Those of us who are redeemed still retain an aspect of our fallen nature. You know, we live in a dying, decaying, corrupting world. So trouble defines life. I mean, our lives are filled with more than enough trouble for each and every one of us, whether it be financial, medical, family issues, and so forth. But then we, you know, extend those near to us, our family, our friends, our co-workers, and there could be, there's more trouble. Then those in ministry have to deal with entire congregations or life groups or Sunday schools. But there's no trouble in this one, of course, in our Through the Bible. But then, so that you can see how in life we wind up accumulating all of these troubles. So how do we handle life? Should we be discouraged, despondent, despairing? How do we deal with this? Well, let's take a look at what the Apostle Paul says and also how Jesus answers him. So picking up here in 2 Corinthians 12, I'll be reading straight through from verse 1 through 10. We'll be focusing primarily on verses 7 through 10, but we need to cover a little bit here on these first six verses too. I, Paul, must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. That's important. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except in my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. Verse 7. So to keep me from becoming conceited or prideful because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities for when I'm weak then I am strong as a little side note here in verse 2 Paul talks about the third heavens you can kind of see the illustration here so what's going on in the ancient Hebrew conception of the universe you had the atmosphere the sky the birds were seen to fly there is the sky the wind and so forth then above that you had what we'd say is space. Sun, moon, the stars. So that would be the second heavens. The third heavens was the unseen realm where God dwelled. That actually literally heaven, which would be equated with paradise. Then below the earth would be Sheol or hell. And they believed that hell was a physical place that only the dead that did not die in faith, but the would go to. And they also had a fascinating um, view of how the earth was. They believed that the earth was floating on the sea, all the land masses, and they had pillars or foundations that went down and secured the land masses in place so they wouldn't just float and drift away. And it's just kind of a little fascinating how they viewed the uh, world there. So moving, okay. So what's looking at verses 1 through 6 here. Paul 
is being attacked again by these false apostles. They claimed that only true apostles had special revelations. So Paul had never publicly, obviously, declared to the Corinthians his special revelations and visions from the Lord. So here they're attacking him, not knowing that Paul had been blessed by the Lord. And so Paul, in chapter 10, knew, and he knows that boasting is senseless and so forth, but he has to defend his ministry. So he starts off giving a list of all the sufferings that he has gone through for the Lord. I'm going to read it quickly. It's chapter 11, verse 23 through 30. So I'll quickly go through this because it's important to see all that Paul went through. So he says, are they servants of Christ? He's talking about the true, the false apostles. I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times shipwrecked, a night and a day adrift at sea. Frequent dangers from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false teachers, in toil and hardship, many a sleepless night, hungry, thirsty, often without food, cold and exposed. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of the anxiety for all my churches. Who is weak? Am I not weak? Who has made the fall? Am I not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Wow. Paul had quite the life of sufferings for the Lord, but he persevered. He kept going. He wrote most of the New Testament. The Lord really blessed him there. So these special revelations that he went through obviously are not profitable because you can't reproduce them. They were just for Paul. That's, and they can't be verified because it's just Paul's word. That's why he's leery to talk about them. Then when he goes up into heaven and comes back, he can't talk about what he saw in heaven. He says words cannot be uttered there. This also makes me leery about the stories of people that have claimed to have a near-death experience and have gone up to heaven and come back. Uh, some have been disproved. There was a famous one of a little child. Well, like the little child story of heaven basically came off to like a Candyland story. It really didn't add up with the Bible. And then some of these other stories. So just be careful when you come across someone who says they've been to heaven and come back. Not only that, Jesus discussed this in Luke 16. Lazarus and the rich man in Abraham's bosom. The rich man is basically in hell. And he asked to go back to the world and tell his family and his friends how terrible it is. What's our Lord say to him? Even if you went back, no one would believe you. So be careful about that. So Paul has visions and revelations. Quick question. Can anybody tell me the difference quickly between a vision and a dream? An inspired dream from the Lord. Go ahead, Michael. Isn't the dream you're actually sleeping? You're like, sleeping. Like uh, yes. Nebuchadnezzar and Pharaoh. Yes. So a dream, you're asleep, but it's still inspired from the Lord. A vision, you're awake. Like um, Isaiah 6, yeah. there's no hint that, I, that Isaiah was asleep. Yet Daniel had both visions and dreams, and he uh, discusses the difference of them. Now, it's interesting about visions. Prophets could see the future, God's plan for the future. The visions reveal what would happen or was happening in the spiritual world. So prophets believed that the spiritual world was as real as the physical. So they saw no distinction between what they saw by God giving them this vision or a dream and what others what we would see in your daily life. And so the difference though was God gifted them with the ability to see things as they truly were, both spiritual and physical and they could see the spiritual forces that were at work behind the visible reality that we all see oh and then uh, another real quick point on this too so when paul went up to heaven he says he didn't know if it was bodily or spiritual people like to argue over this um personally i think it was spiritual because the two instances in the bible where people bodily were raptured or ascended into heaven were enoch and Elijah, they didn't come back. 
or didn't come back yet. Elijah was probably coming back. So I would say it's probably spiritual, but that, that's just neither here nor there. All right, let's get into our main points this morning. There are four great profound lessons from Paul for us here today. Paul lays them down for us to understand. This is how to approach the deepest disappointments in life. How to approach the deepest trials in life. These principles sustained Paul through his heartbreak, through his extreme suffering of the Corinthian church turning their back on him. They will sustain you and I if we believe them, trust in them, and go for it. So, and it takes a lifelong process of sanctification to trust the Lord on this, but let's continue to grow and see how we can institute these into our life. So the first point will be, God uses suffering to humble us. Then he uses sufferings to draw us to him, to draw us closer. Third, God wants to display his grace through our sufferings. And fourth, God uses sufferings to perfect his power in us. The Bible says, Humility is the ultimate virtue. Pride is the ultimate sin. So, Paul's troubles come to him for the primary reason to keep him from exalting himself. I believe, this is speculation, but that Paul got those four special revelations for the purpose of not being devastated through all the sufferings he went through. I mean, next to Jesus Christ... Paul is one of the few who suffered almost as much as you could even imagine. So he would have probably been just falling apart without the Lord giving him the grace and the four special revelations and giving him extra love. Go ahead. Well, in Acts' account, um, or one of the versions that Paul gives about his testimony, he states that Christ was going to show him what he was going to suffer for him in fulfilling his calling of reaching Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So he knew from the very beginning when Ananias came and, and baptized him and had a conversation with him that he was going to be have a difficult yes. time as a minister. Mm -hmm. So he knew right from the get-go what to expect. Yes. Even if you know, though, it still hurts. Yeah, sure. Yes. Okay, and then so Paul, why do you need to be humbled? Think about this. Here's Paul. And say, here's Timothy and Silas. And they're having a debate about ministry and what to do. Paul could pull out a trump card and go, Now, Timothy, Silas, how many visions, how many revelations have you had? How many times have you guys been up to heaven? Now, we're going to do things my way. So you can see how it would be pretty easy to become prideful there. And then also, we know that the humbler you are, the more powerful you are. Look at Moses. Numbers 12.3 says, At the time that Moses lived... There was no one more humble than him on the face of the earth. Moses was very mightily used by the... Yes, God. Go ahead, Katie. Um, just a point. God uses suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, God doesn't cause suffering. Sin does. Uh, yes, he actually he does. He, does cause, he does cause suffering, yes. Uh, think about Job. I'm going to mention that in, in a couple of minutes. I will get to your point. So just hold on because I'll be bringing that up. Um, then Jesus Christ, Philippians 2, 7. No one ever suffered more than our Lord and Savior. Yes, he was fully God, but he was also fully man. Uh, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross for our sins. Now, okay. now sometimes... When trouble arises in our lives, and for me, um, personally, there's areas that I'm, I'm growing in and I'm not always worried about. And it's not indifference, it's not arrogance, it's not being naive or denial of the facts. It's learning 2 Corinthians 12. I've learned to a small point, this is definitely a work in progress, to embrace some disappointments, embrace some pain, trust the Lord, because this is what... Because these sufferings are going to come in our lives. And it's just something, if you fight against them, it's going to be harder. And the, and it, the Lord could make them even worse. Um, another question, if it goes along with this. Stonewall Jackson. Has everybody heard of him? Civil War Confederate hero. Does anybody know how he earned the nickname or title or whatever moniker Stonewall? Can you tell us quickly? 
he stood there like a stone wall and all the bullets were passing. Yes, and this uh, soldiers rallied and said, let's rally behind General Jackson. He's there like a stone wall. He also had a famous phrase that he uh, said that he is as comfortable in bed as he is on the battlefield. Wow, think about that for a second. Now, he was a strong Christian. Uh, some of us might say he was on the wrong side, but some from the South say he was on the right side. <laughs> but um, unfortunately, he was... Uh, shot by his own men at night and stuff and his life was cut short some some historians even believe that if he was not his life was not cut short that the south would have had a greater chance of winning the war with him because he was such a powerful general but to be as comfortable in bed as you are on the battlefield and he obviously lived it that's something for us all to strive for in our daily lives okay going back to paul here paul receives this thorn in the flesh he didn't ask for this. It's and it this it's a gift. Unfortunately, it's not a good gift. It's and it, well, it is a good gift for Paul, but it comes across as good and bad in a sense. Um, as with Job, think about this, and this goes back to you, Katie. Job suffering, Satan was the immediate cause, but God was the ultimate cause because God allowed Satan to go after Job. It's the same here with is, Paul. He's allowing Satan. Mm. That's what, that was my impression. I was always under the impression that God allowed Satan to tempt him and, and to cause to allow those things to happen but, to him, but God wasn't the cause of it. He was like trying to prove that Job's love for him was so strong that no matter what you do to him, I'll allow you to do anything. I'm not going to do it, but I will allow you to do it. But, no matter what, he's still going to come to me and love. But see, so God still God allowing it. God knows it's going to happen. Um, I guess we're going to start debating um, words on this. I don't want to get into that, but in a sense, God knows everything that's going to happen. God allow, okay, God allows it. Um, so then, God, if God's allowing it, <coughs> God's in control of it. In a sense, it was right. So. Yeah, but now God does not create evil per se. But God, if God's allowing Satan to do it, God, in a sense, is in control. Of he's the situation, chosen, he's chosen to include it. Yeah. The actions I think of what we're that um, the cause of suffering and to prove that God is faithfulness also prove us that have purity that we are faithful. Yes. Obedient mm -hmm. to His grace and um, just analogy like you have uh, the the craft the craftsman the craftsmanship that. Burning the gold, mm -hmm. the impurity will go out, right. and the pure yes. 100 carat, 24 carat gold, it never burned out, it's still mm -hmm. pure. Yes. So that is our life. Yes, very, very good point, Sarah. Thank you. All right, well, and I have to say, go ahead. And then also, see, there's always an agenda. Is it Satan's agenda, or is it the Lord's agenda? And then if you're going through all of this, Lord, immediately, I would, I'm trying to learn to say, what, what's your plan with this, Lord? What do you want to accomplish? Within me, my growth, faith, what do you want to show doctors, etc., others? But what is your, may your agenda, Father God, be accomplished, not Satan's? Yes. Not Satan's. Very good. So, okay. God's never, God is interested in our humility. Satan's not. Satan wants us to be prideful. He wants us to be arrogant. Because if we're prideful and arrogant, we're going to step out of the Lord's will. And then, as Mom mentioned, it would start getting into Satan's agenda, not God's. Okay, we're going to kind of move it along here. Thorn. Thorn is the word scallops. In Greek, it is not a ro like a rose bush thorn. No, it is not like a little prick in the finger. Thorn is like, think of a Roman spear. Wood spear, maybe it has metal pointed at the end, like what was used for G when they poked Jesus on his side. That is what the Greek word thorn means. Not a little prick in the finger, a deadly weapon. So this is serious, Paul's thorn in the flesh. Not just an inconvenience, a deadly attack, so to speak, against him. And then so it goes thorn in the flesh, and then the next phrase in verse 7 is messenger of Satan. The word messenger in the Greek is angelos. It means angel. 
means messenger from God. So in this instance, it's demons, fallen angels. Maybe they're possessing the false teachers or specifically the ringleader against Paul. The word angelos shows up 175 to 188 times depending on the manuscripts in the New Testament. It always refers to a person. So I don't know why theologians like to argue and say the thorn in the flesh, messenger of Satan, and so forth, might be Paul like an inner psychological struggle, or Paul maybe had an eye disease because in one of his ways he talked about see the large letters, maybe he had malaria, maybe he had migraines. Yes, maybe he had those ailments, but in this context, talking about the false teachers, it seems to make sense that the thorn in the flesh is one of the false teachers attacking him and probably demon possessed. Then in the Old Testament, the equivalent word for thorn is sake. And it refers to Israel's enemies, which are deadly, in a sense, the enemies of Israel. Uh, four instances, Numbers 33:55, Joshua 23:13, Judges 2:3, Ezekiel 28:24, all talk about Israel's enemies being a thorn to them. So well, I, I hope you guys would agree that's most likely demon-possessed ringleader attacking him. So why would God allow or want this harassing or tormenting of Paul? Well, we're talking about him being humbled. The word harass or torment, depending in your Bible, is the word kolophizo. And it means to strike with your fist, to literally punch someone with your knuckles. Like when the soldiers were beating Jesus in Matthew 26 and Mark 14, and they were punching him. This is a severe way to keep Paul humble. When you agree, I mean, we have harassment, tormenting, a deadly thorn in the flesh. I mean, is there anything worse than God allowing the minions of Satan to torment you? Wow. And so, God wants us to stay humble. Entire book of Job. How about Peter in Luke 22? Satan wanted to sift Peter like wheat. But Jesus said, after you have repented and come back, you'll be the rock of the church and you'll restore your brethren. And so uh, Sarah brought up a little bit about some of these purposes of trials or suffering. To test our strength of faith. Wean us from worldly things. Make heaven more inviting. Reveal what we love, what we value. Produce endurance or steadfastness in us. Give us empathy and sympathy to minister to others who may be going through seri serious, similar trials that we've gone through and that we can relate to them. Also, Romans 5, 4, sufferings produce character. So to be successful in the kingdom serving the Lord, we need to remain humble. God uses sufferings to, to humble us for our good. Few of God's successful true servants whether they be well-known ministers or even all the way down to janitors who have reached unknown people, countless people for the Lord, they have all gone through some kind of hindrance, weakness, or opposition. And so, excuse me, so will we. Okay, we all know Spurgeon. I know I'm kind of going quickly through these points here to get through. So we all know Spurgeon. We all love him as a hero of the faith. Do you know how much he suffered every day of his life? Let me quickly go through this. October 19th, 1856. It was Sunday night. He was doing his service. It was at the Royal Surrey Gardens Music Hall. It held 10,000 people in there. I'm sorry, 12,000. They estimated 10,000 more outside. He did his opening prayer. Some evil, malicious miscreants snuck in and yelled, Fire! The galleries are giving way. There was pandemonium, there was panic, there was stampeding. Seven people died. 28 had to be seriously hospitalized. Spurgeon just fell apart. He literally had to be carried from the pulpit and taken to a friend's house. He didn't eat, he barely drank for days. Went into a deep bout of depression. From time to time throughout the rest of his life, he would suffer bouts of depression that immobilized him. There were times he couldn't even preach on Sundays two or three weeks in a row. Then, at 35 years old, he contracted gout. They didn't have really gout medicine back then. Then, a little bit later, he got Bright's disease, chronic painful inflammation of the kidneys. Again, they really didn't have a lot of medicine back then. Finally, near the end of his life, there was the downgrade controversy. Basically, liberalism was taking over all the churches of England, 
and they started attacking Spurgeon personally because he stayed true to the word of God. Wow, he suffered a lot. But the, one second, think about all the writings, all the sermons. We study him today. We love him today. We utilize him today. He was a great hero of the faith. Go ahead, Shirley. He also was challenged by Darwin Theory. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so another one of those there. All right, so our second major point today, God uses sufferings to draw us to him. Paul pleaded three times for it to be removed. Jesus also prayed three times in the Garden of Gethsemane for his cup to be removed before going to the cross. Both Paul and Jesus in this instance had their request denied because it was for the greater good. But they were granted extra special grace to endure the ordeals that they were going to be going through. So Paul was humbled. He goes to the Lord. Um, you guys remember a while back I gave a sermon on the uh, gentleman who starts banging on his neighbor's door in the middle of the night looking for bread because his friend showed up? The key word in that sermon was importunity, which is begging someone to do something, being overly persistent, becoming annoying. Well, so, importunity is like ask, seek, and knock. So Paul goes to the Lord three times. He fulfills importunity. And he finally, he gets to the point that the Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you. So Paul stops asking because he has his answer. But it shows us to consistently go to the Lord in prayer for some, whatever the issue is until we get that final answer. So keep praying, keep praying. Keep petitioning the Lord for whatever is going on in your life or in your family or friends' lives and so forth. Um, so the point here is the Lord humbles us and allows these troubles in our lives to humble us to drive us to Him, to have us become closer to the Lord. Because He wants us to turn away from lesser resources. What are lesser resources? Money, power, prestige, fame. <laughs> food <laughs> friends in high places um, I guess some people food I guess some people turn to alcohol and narcotics and so forth the Lord wants us to turn to him but uh, some people that were humble but strong uh, would become let's see remember Samson he was strong in weakness he crushed the enemies of God Joseph was strong in weakness he rose to the throne of Egypt Job was strong in weakness, got to see the glorious face of God. So you can see how these trials have a perfecting work in our lives as we draw closer to the Lord. Point number three, God uses sufferings to display his grace. This comes from verse 9. Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul received that answer three times to his prayer to remove the thorn in flesh, messenger of Satan. So God gives him the grace to go through this. Um, I like some of these superlatives about grace. Grace is sufficient, surpassing, abundant. It strengthened Paul. He was able to persevere. persevere. So when the Lord says, my grace is sufficient, that's in the present tense. That underscores the ever-present availability and sufficiency of God's grace in our lives. Paul received it, and we receive it too, regardless of how critical or terrible our circumstances it may be. When we go to the Lord, His grace is sufficient. So Paul, you go through this humbling process. It's like a potter and clay out of Jeremiah 18. God's molding us. And if we're fighting back, it's like a lump on the clay, and God's got to just rip it off and tear it off. And it can be quite painful. But when we're close to the Lord, it's like just a little smooth bump in the molding process, and it's not always as painful or as much suffering. And so the key word here is grace. There. And it, it's like, sadly, before we get into that, a lot of times we're closest to the Lord when we're going through a serious problem, right? And we're desperate. Isn't that true but sad, right? We don't live every day of our lives in a point of desperation, but maybe if we could learn to be desperate for the Lord every day of our lives, we might be able to have a few less sufferings and trials. Maybe. Okay, 
regarding grace here. We have two more slides here. Um, another real quick illustration. Spanish-American War. Lieutenant Colonel Teddy Roosevelt in the Rough Riders. He just fought on the Battle of San Juan Hill there in Cuba. And many of his men were sick and wounded. So he goes to the Red Cross and he comes across this lady named Claire Bart. He asks her to buy medicine for his troops. She says no. And he's all upset. He goes, well, how do I get what I need? My men need proper food and medicine. She says, just ask for them. And he goes, wow, okay, well, I do. And she gave them to him for free. And so it was grace, not through a purchase. So just like everything in our lives, as believers, it's all about grace. John MacArthur likes to say grace upon grace upon grace, if you ever hear any of his sermons. Grace is charis, or charis in Greek. Comes up 155 times. It's favor bestowed upon a person. We never earn it. It's unmerited kindness. Grace is everything. Grace is need for our salvation, our sanctification, and our eventual glorification. It's that dynamic power. It transforms us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. It's a divine force. God pours it out in our lives at all points because God needs to grant us the grace so that we could be all that we need to be, that he desires us to be to bring him glory. Or earlier in 2 Corinthians, our sufficiency is from God because God dispenses sufficient grace. And when we come into times of trouble, we should boldly rush to the throne of grace to find help in the time of need from Hebrews 4.16. So let's just think about all the grace the Lord extends to us in our daily lives. You stop and think about there's grace at so many points every day in our lives. So let's remember to dispense grace to others and especially to people you might consider extra grace required. So just remember, God gives us grace, let's give grace to each other as much in every aspect that we can. All right, our last point this morning. God uses suffering to perfect his power in us. So God's most powerful servants are the most humble. So very few people are weak enough to be powerful for the kingdom. But too many are too powerful in the world to be powerful for the Lord. Think about that. The more worldly you are, and I am, the less kingdom-minded and less kingdom impact that we can have for the Lord. No one is ever too weak to be powerful, but many are too strong, or they think they are. The weaker the human instrument the more clearly God's grace shines forth. Think Joni Erickson Tata. Think about all she's done for the Lord being paralyzed. She has, you would say, a weak body. The Lord has used her mightily. She just had cancer, too. And the Lord's still using her. In our weakness, Christ's power dwells within us. And finally, we, it's never the extent of our influence, but the character of it. See, we focus on our character and drawing closer to the Lord, the Lord will extend our influence for him. So as we wrap up here, Paul was a human being just like you and I. He took no pleasure in pain and in suffering, but he rejoiced in the power of Christ that was being revealed through him. And that's an objective we should all strive for, is rejoicing that the Lord is using us. Then individually, none of us are indispensable to the kingdom. God's not holding his breath up there in heaven hoping that we will continue on our faith journey. And that should give us a healthy pause, a healthy fear, and a desire to stay close to the Lord because we're not indispensable for him. But so what God's concerned about, it's our humility, our spiritual integrity. He wants us to be honoring to Christ who is the ultimate model of humility and power. Remember, no one ever humbled themselves like Jesus did. No one was ever more besieged or attacked. In Jesus' weakest moment on the cross, yet he came out in absolute triumph. So we need to put the same death to our pride so that we can rise to power in our weakness. So let God determine the range of our influence. And what's all... Stay in humble servants to the Lord and leave the results to our Heavenly Father. So, wrap up here. 
we sufferings help keep us humble. They want to, we need to use them to draw us closer to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so that He can display His grace to us while also perfecting His power in us. I sure hope this message surprises, excites, and encourages you because it sure does me. Let's close here in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank You and praise You that we're able to come here this morning for such a wonderful time together in both the main service and here in our Through the Bible Equipped class. We know that every time we gather here together like this, we're coming into Your presence in a special way. For we have heard from heaven through Your Word. We've praised You through song and worship there in the main service. We've prayed the truth of Your Word. We've read it. We've heard it expounded. You've spoken to us all today, and we're now accountable to apply what we've heard in both services in our lives. Since we do love your truth, your word, we ask that you work this work of humility in us. Keep us humble so that we are weak in our own confidence and strength and power, so that we need and desire to be strong in you, so that we can be useful for your kingdom, Lord. We pray continued blessings on all of us and those who are traveling, those who are at home sick. We pray that we have a blessed week here and are excited to come back together next week. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.